So we've got a fairly good crowd with us tonight. So sort of go through. It's going to, it's going to be a, some great programs tonight. Um, let me go down. So normal standard. A couple of announcements. Uh, just a real brief club report tonight. I know Dave's got some uh, things he wants to talk to you about conservation, um, including some fish enhancement activities. Um, start talking about the 222 outings, and uh, then Marv's going to give us a, actually a recount of the uh, Merrill, Lake, Merrill Lake fish count from a couple of weekends ago. I, I looked at the report, real interesting numbers. And then uh, for our program, we're going to talk about uh, restoring salmon and steelhead above uh, Swift Dam. Um, I'm real interested in this. I've always been you know, reading about what releasing fish above the, the dam, but I've never known what the uh, intent is or what the results have been. So that's going to be our program for this evening. So Don, I'm not sure what what are we doing for coffee in November, or are we? Don Kohler, the space bar. All right, all right. <laughs> uh, you're all invited to have coffee uh, this morning at 10 o'clock. Oh, next month, John Geyer and are going to take a look at the weather conditions and uh, probably determine. The Maybe a week prior meeting. to uh, <coughs> the same date that we would have a club meeting and I see if gonna uh, it's going to be nasty enough that we don't want to do it. So that's kind of up in the air right now. We had 15 okay. people there today, Mark's which is a good, the best turnout we've had in about three months. Super. And uh, we will let folks know what through Google Groups. Is that how we're going to contact people? Yeah, we'll do it through Google Groups. That's worked pretty good. In fact, I sent an email out this morning because I forgot to do it a couple days ago. And I had three people respond. Thanks for the email. I can't make it. But, you know, at least they saw it. Okay, great. So um, I have, I uh, did take, spend some time and put everybody is on Google Groups unless you've unsubscribed. If you find yourself unsubscribed and want to get back on, just let me know and we'll get you back on the list. There are about 200 people on the list right now um, at the current time. Don. Super. Thanks, Don. Thanks, Don. Um, just from, yes. So um, just from a brief club report, uh, 155 paid members to date, uh, same as last month. Uh, finances roughly the same. We stand in good, uh, good stead, uh, especially with the grant reserves so we can respond to uh, some of the conservation demands that are now finding their way across our desk. Uh, we did have a board meeting uh, Monday. Uh, we confirmed that it looks like in-person meetings will probably start at the earliest, in early 2022. Uh, meetings will be held at Club Green Meadows, which is a new name added to the mix. Uh, uh, Perry and her team, including John Bala and, uh, and Forrest and others, um, have identified that as the best option, and the board authorized entering into a contract with Club Green Meadows. Um, I believe the earliest that we're really looking at is February of 2022. Uh, but of course, uh, we're going to be paying attention to the uh, COVID and the health guidance and the COVID protocols in place at that time. And so we'll continue to keep you, um, uh, keep you up, to, up to speed on what, what, what our thinking is at the time. But it looks like the earliest is 2022. Thanks again to Perry and her team for <laughs> a lot of work. Um, trying to do multivariate analysis on with a whole bunch of unknowns out there, uh, but it, we do, do look like we have a place at this point in time. Um, it continues to be not the uh, board uh, elections will be held in November. There's still time if you wish to um, be on the board of directors to put your name into the hat. Um, I'm in the prop, the board did approve a nominated slate here, but it doesn't mean we've closed nominations. I'll open it up at the uh, November meeting. And, um, and elections will happen. So if you want to serve on the board of directors, uh, please raise your hand. So uh, conservation report, Dave. All right, uh, let me just bring up my notes here. So uh, things have gotten busy on the conservation front just in the last few weeks. Um, we have a couple of events going on. Um, you've probably heard about the nutrient enhancement on the Lewis River. Um, that's where we're, we're helping with the cutting of tails for, of salmon carcasses and returning the carcasses to the river, uh, cutting the tails so that they aren't double counted um, by the Washington fish biologists doing surveys. 
Uh, John Geyer had put out an excellent slideshow highlighting that event uh, this week. So uh, check that out if you haven't seen that. Um, we do have another event coming up this Tuesday at the Steelier Hatchery. And currently we have two people signed up. Uh, so we could use a couple more. Uh, so please shoot me an email uh, if you could make that. Um, two people is okay, but uh, we could really use a couple more for maximum efficiency there. Um, Question, Dave. Yes. Um, are your are you shooting for a, a set day every week, or will these days for the nutrient enhancement change from week to week? Um, it is generally every Tuesday. Okay. Um, so the, the, there are four more dates. There's the October 26th of next week, November 2nd, November 16th, and November 23rd. Um, the next two or three will be at Spilia, and then the location may switch. And I'll, I'll let people know when I do. I uh, haven't heard yet. Um, but yes, generally every Tuesday, there was an exception with the first event was on a Thursday. But that, that is an exception. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's next Tuesday is the next event and it should be following Tuesdays. Okay, okay thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a club event. Um, we also have, um, we were basically have been invited to help with some tree planting at the Steigerwald National Wildlife Refuge. Uh, this is being coordinated by the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership, which is a group that is really kind of uh, organizing that whole habitat restoration, the big reconnection project at Steigerwald, where they're doing a massive levee setback uh, at the refuge so that uh, they're actually gonna let the historic wetlands at the refuge flood during the high spring summer flows of the Columbia. Um, so those dates are November 13th and November 20th. You can sign up through the Lower Columbia Estuary Partnership. Uh, I did send an email about, out about this uh, about a week ago. Um, so you can uh, search for that uh, or shoot me an email um, if you have, can't find it. Um, so it's tree planting, but it also will give you a chance to see uh, the habitat restoration that's been done. This is like the big year for that habitat restoration project. And it's a like a $30 million restoration project. This is not a small project. Uh, they took an elevated stream channel that Gibbons Creek uh, used to flow through. Um, we did a huge fish salvage, trying to remove fish. We, we caught something like 14,000 juvenile lamprey before they relocated that stream channel. They dug a whole new stream channel uh, down to, uh, there's a small lake on the property that, and that then runs out into the Columbia. There's huge setback levees built with a 500 year floodplain, huge wood addition. So um, you'll have a chance to check that out, hopefully, uh, if you get out there for the tree planting. Um, we have a grant application that has come in from the Native Fish Society. Uh, they are requesting funds for three cleanup events uh, next year on the Kalama River. Um, they are basically organizing volunteers and they're asking for funds to pay for things like uh, gloves, garbage bags, disposal fees, you know, everything that's needed as part of a river cleanup. Uh, the board of directors uh, discussed the grant Monday's meeting. We're going to be seeking some clar clarifications uh, from the writer of the grant, just clear up a few questions uh, and probably vote on it next month. Uh, we also are um, expecting full grants shortly, uh, one from the Cascade Forest Conservancy. Uh, they sent us a letter of intent uh, regarding um, their plans uh, to do some beaver reintroduction to headwater streams in the Gifford Pinchot National Forest, uh, which I think personally is a pretty cool project. Um, and we have also gotten an inquiry from the World Salmon Council um, to help support their Salmon Watch programs, like so many programs under COVID, they've had to go to all virtual. Uh, for those who don't know, the Salmon Watch is a program that takes school kids out onto the stream 
teaches them, brings in volunteers, uh, teach them about salmon biology, riparian habitats, macroinvertebrates, and um, water chemistry. Um, I've actually taken part in it for three years myself. Um, and I think it's a really good program. And I, you know, like a lot of organizations that depend on face-to-face you know, -face, uh, interaction are kind of hurting for money since they've had to uh, cancel their, their programs for the last two years now. Um, but we, we are waiting on that grant. Haven't actually gotten that one yet either. Um, so that's that's pretty much what's going on. Any questions? Excellent, Dave. Um, folks have said that he said uh, if you want to get a hold of him, to email him. His email is in the bottom of the barb, so it's located there. And I do want to thank John Geyer. This is his photo of the fish enhancement. Uh, he is a, seems to be the club's unofficial official photographer. So and I appreciate him always sharing these photos with me. Michael Golub, outings 2021-2022. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. All right, so <laughs> Merrill Lake outing, um, you know, thanks to the Fishmaster Warren, Marvin and Hutch there. Also, I think it was a, a very nice ceremony uh, remembering Ralph there. Um, I think we had a nice turnout with some of Ralph's family and everything. So, um, you know, my hat's off to the three of them. They did a really nice job of organizing that, had all the materials there, um, you know, and really ready to go. So I know Marvin's going to give a report on that. So I won't speak to that. So let's go on to the next one. So unfortunately, the fish count for the Wind River is, is really low. So it's close to, to fishing. Um, so we're going to have to cancel the Wind River outing for this year. Um, and, um, you know, we'll see how this goes forward in, in, in the next years. But uh, it just it, I think everybody knows, especially the steelhead count all up and down the Columbia Basin has been really low this year. So uh, the uh, 2022 calendar. So I sent out emails a couple weeks ago and I was very pleased. I got a lot of response back from everybody really quickly. Um, and um, I think really we're about 90% of the outings for next year have fish masters that have already signed up willing to do it. Um, you know, some of the uh, events are, are pretty standard what we did this last year. Uh, some of the dates are changed around a little bit trying to get more in line with the fish runs and also just some of the fish masters have some personal, um, you know, events that they've got to plan around. But we'll be able to lock that down, I think, here by the end of November, which is nice that we have that laid out. We are looking for a couple of fish masters to help out. Al Woods for the Cowlitz, he's done that for a number of years. He's kind of looking for somebody to help out this year and maybe take that event over in the future. So if you have an interest, uh, please let me know. And then the John Day outing, if we want to have that again, um, I would like to have a fishmaster for that. I'm certainly willing to help out there as I, um, Mark Meyer and I were the fishmasters for last year. I did move the dates back a little bit in June. Um, last year, it was, a, it was a great outing, but it was uh, chilly, windy, and cold. Um, but we did catch it. A few fish, and the fish we caught were really nice sized fish. It was great uh, for springer fishing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> They've got, got a nice salmon uh, by surprise there. Um, and then, you know, there's a couple outings that we have. We have the Kalama outing that we have scheduled towards the last part of June. Um, unfortunately, the river's been low, not a lot of fish in at that time. So, um, might look at a replacement for that. Um, we have moved the fall Olympia Peninsula outing into September. So we're looking for a fill in for um, the August time frame. And Don Kohler and Carol have offered up um, a, a lake in uh, Washington to maybe cover that time frame. And then, you know, we've been, it's been really hit and miss with the Wind River. I think it's been canceled at least in my memory, about three out of four years. So 
Um, if we're going to put it on the Wind River on the calendar, I think we do need to have a replacement event lined up for uh, November, uh, just in case the situation doesn't change with the, the fish count there. So that's kind of the, the fishing reports and uh, we'll have an update next month on the, um, the initial look at the 2022 calendar and I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Bart or Marv, if you wanna talk about the Merrill Lake uh, results. I'll, I'll turn it over to Marv uh, just shortly. I wanna say thank Michael for putting this all together and thank you to all the fish masters who supported the trips this year. And thank you for stepping up so early and robustly for 2022 already. I think it kind of uh, speaks to the value that these uh, trips have and how much of a great time we have. So uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Fishmasters. And thank you for 2022 Fishmasters. Whoops, where did I put? There they are. So, Marv, you want to talk about uh, Merrill Lake Fish In 2021? Sure. sure. Well, this was uh, Merrill Lake Fish In. Number three, uh, third year we've done it, and we've had uh, a good turnout this year. We had uh, 32 anglers, which is more than we've had in the previous two years. Uh, last year we had 30. Uh, most of them, uh, the participants came from uh, the club. Uh, we had uh, four people that were either employees of Washington Fish and Wildlife or affiliated with them. And then also we had uh, a number of anglers who were interested in what we were doing. They saw us sitting there on the bank and asked, you know, what are you guys doing? And so we'd explain to what we were doing, to them what we were doing, and they, they got interested. And we asked, you know, some of them if uh, they'd like to help out. And so they said, sure. Uh, so we gave them measuring boards and the data sheets, and uh, they went out and uh, caught some fish, recorded them, and brought the sheets back. So some of them expressed uh, interest in joining the club. So we may get some new members. Uh, also, I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of the other folks that were involved in this uh, fish in. Warren Beaker was the co uh, fish master, and uh, Jim Hutchison was our unofficial uh, co fish master. He did some behind the scenes work, but uh, didn't want to have his name up in print. And uh, Brian Joe Smith uh, prepared the uh, measuring boards that we had uh, for this year. We made some new boards, uh, had all the fish measured in millimeters. Uh, for scientific purposes. So uh, this year we had uh, total numbers of hours fished was 119.5, uh, a little bit less than we had last year with 30 people. Uh, uh, the average turned out to be about uh, three and a half hours uh, per angler fishing. Last year it was 5.4. Uh, total number of fish caught was 112 uh, and it worked out to uh, almost a fish an hour, which was uh, comparable to last year, actually a little higher than last year's count. Uh, species we caught, uh, cutthroat uh, were the main fish that uh, was caught, were caught uh, that on the outing, uh, 90, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the 112 fish were cutthroat, uh, 21 rainbow recorded and one brown. Uh, as you can see, the Maximum length was about 363 millimeters, about 14, little over 14 inches. Minimum length, 192 millimeters for cutthroat, about 7.6 inches. And the average was uh, 298 millimeters, uh, about 11, just a little short of 12 inches. Uh, that size was pretty close to what we got last year for the average length. Rainbows, uh, 315 millimeters, uh, 12, a little over 12, almost 12 and a half inches. Smallest eight inches, 203 millimeters, and uh, average is about 9.7 inches. And the one brown that was caught was about 300 millimeters, uh, about 11 inches. Uh, can go to the next uh, slide. Uh, excuse me a minute. How yes. do you determine the number, per, uh, I can't say it, press to sized, par the ones with parasites? Your oh, last call. Uh, what, we, what we did was, uh, asked uh, the anglers to try to pick out uh, copepod parasites. They're little small white uh, critters or copepods. There's crustaceans that are about the size of a, a grain of rice. And so we explained to the, uh, all the participants to look for those, uh, particularly around the fins, maybe the gill or mouth. And uh, so we asked people to take a careful look at the fish and see if they could spot those. And so that's what they were doing. And uh, they came up with you know, roughly 35.5% of the cutthroat were 
uh, affected by copepods. Uh, and what is the significance some people, of that? Pardon me? What is the significance of that? Uh, they can affect the, the health of the fish. So, so one third of the cutthroats were infected. Pardon me? One third of the cutthroats were infected. Uh, roughly, yeah. And in some cases, uh, some of the boats came up with about two thirds of the fish uh, that they checked being affected. <laughs> Okay, uh, kind of a comparison of the uh, three years. Uh, in 2019, we only had 11 anglers fish. They fished 48.6 hours, caught uh, about 1.3 fish per hour, fished uh, about four and a half, 4.4 hours per angler. 2020, uh, 30 anglers fished 162 and a half hours, and uh, of course, came up to 5.4 hours per angler and uh, about eight tenths of a fish per hour. 2021, more, more anglers, uh, fewer hours fished, and uh, more fish per hour. Uh, what I think happened in uh, 2019, 2020 was that we had better weather, for one thing. It was a nice sunny day each of those years. 2021, it was kind of cloudy, and uh, it started to rain on us. And a number of people had other commitments, uh, so they couldn't stay the whole day. So that's why you see the lower uh, number of hours being uh, spent on, in this year's uh, outing. And the next bit. And just comparing uh, the three years data, uh, you can see that cutthroat uh, you know, dominated uh, the catch in each year and right around 80% of the catch uh, each year. Rainbows range somewhere between 15 and uh, a little over 20% each year. And the browns, uh, we didn't catch many browns each year, but uh, you can see the numbers are declining. Uh, so if you were caught, we really hmm. can't say you know, if that uh, represents a decline in the number of fish. But uh, we're hoping that uh, the stocking that uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, has uh, said they're going to do with browns will uh, result in more browns being caught in the future. Uh, they're kind of a treat to catch those in the lake because uh, usually they're uh, some larger fish. Uh, last year, the biggest fish was a brown that was around uh, 19 and a half inches. So uh, they get big, and we've heard reports of bigger fish. So that uh, is a quick summary. Uh, I think Bart sent out a copy of the report uh, to all the members. So if you're interested in uh, more detail on the report and what happened out there, uh, just look to that or uh, email me a, a, a question or a comment. Yeah, the uh, report was sent out to the Google Groups list here about six o'clock tonight. So look in your inbox. Uh, it's an interesting report uh, uh, and real interesting results. So thank you, Marv. Thank you, Warren. Thank you, Hutch, uh, for putting this together over the last three years. Uh, well, one other the thing, uh, next year's outing, uh, we agreed to have it the 15th of October, 2022. Okay, put that on your calendars. So I always appreciate you shifting the millimeters. It's uh, much uh, better to tell someone I caught something at 323 than 12 inches. So I just want to point out your different percentages. But I imagine the fishermen are using different techniques, and some of those techniques may be effective for one species and not another. Uh, it may be. I've tried various techniques uh, and uh, various parts of the lake, deep water, shallow water. Uh, I'm having trouble catching rainbows. I don't know about anybody else. Uh, most of the fish, I, in fact, every fish I caught this year, I think was a cutthroat. Interesting. I think there might be something to that because I fished it last year and I was almost exclusively trolling deep and I caught almost all rainbows while most people were catching cutthroat. And this spring after the cleanup, I also was trolling deep and all I caught were browns. Interesting. Oh, they ran along. Nope, there's a master's thesis in there somewhere. So. <laughs> Thank you again for all your effort. Oops, I think I skipped over fishing reports. So let's, uh, any uh, stunning fishing reports here for the last month since we met last? Heard a couple during the uh, wet fly hour, but are there any others that went up and fishing? I'll bring up one, but it's not local. I had the opportunity to fish Pyramid Lake in Nevada, and I won't go into the details, but it's no farther than going to Montana 
It's twice as far as going to Lenore or to OMAC. And it's definitely worth checking out. Hmm. Excellent. Great and story. it's a pretty interesting story if you Google it. Uh, they had cut off all native reproduction of the Lahushan cutthroat in that lake. And they restocked it with a certain strain. And then a, about a dozen years ago, they found the original Pyramid Lake straight cutthroat in a small creek in Utah. And they've reintroduced them into Pyramid Lake. And they're really excited down there about how, they're, how well they're doing. Excellent, excellent. So Pyramid Lake's on the list. Any other places should be on my list? Well, I stopped at a uh, diamond on the way down. That was the first time I fished it and I liked it. Okay. In the Cascades, Diamond Lake. I've read about that. Uh, <laughs> I only got rainbows, but people were getting some big tiger trout. Last month, uh, I reminded the crew that Gene Reiner was out on a visit from Denver. So we took him fishing to Coldwater Lake. Uh, Carol and I and Gene were there. Don Grant showed up. And we had a great day fishing. The fish even had a better day. We only caught one for the four of us fishing for about six hours. Uh, the next day, we went oh. up to Goose Lake and had a typical 20-plus day fishing up there. So made up for Gene's trip out here. He was happy to go fishing. So I did fish Coldwater Lake on Saturday. Um, beautiful day. Um, temperature problem with no wind for most of the day. We fished the far end of the lake. Uh, Tony Johnson and I, former, who's a former club member. And um, surprisingly, we caught only a few fish, about six fish. Um, to about four, largest one was 14 inches, um, which uh, was, uh, we were expecting different, but uh, it was still beautiful up there. The leaves are turning. Um, I would definitely go up, if you don't want to go fish, go up, take a hike. The maples are all uh, turning up there. There's some fresh snow up on the mountain. So it's uh, quite, quite stunning. But the fishing was a little slow, so. Well, this is um, Steve Jones. I'm, there were four club members that went up to Northern BC. Uh, that was over Labor Day. Um, I don't know whether this got discussed at the September meeting in uh, much detail or not. Did anybody, um, we, we did get into some sockeye. We got uh, coho and, um, but for the most part, it was really heavy rains and the river was pretty blown out and we didn't get any shots at Steelhead to speak of, which was really our intent of going there. But uh, beautiful country. We flew in and out of Terrace and uh, I'm definitely interested in doing it again. I'm just hoping that we don't get the kind of rains we got this past year when you know, the river was pretty much blown out, but everybody got into nice fish. Uh, Roy, Peter, John Borenson, and myself went up there. I don't know it would be the rain, but I saw that it's not only the Columbia River, but the Skeena River this year has a, a real significant drop off on the number of returning steelhead. It, uh, it did have, yes. It did have a significant drop off. So it seems like the steelhead issue is a West Coast issue. It's not just the Columbia River. That's true. Ocean conditions. Yeah, they actually closed the Skeena on the 17th of October. So, mm -hmm. so it's now closed due to low numbers. So any other fishing reports out there? Mark, um, this is Warren Beaker. Um, not really a fishing report, but I'm sorry I didn't ask to put this on the agenda earlier. I would uh, encourage anybody who fishes Merrill from now till the 15th of November when it closes to be sure and fill out the angler survey uh, from the angler survey box there at the head of the, of the launch ramp. Um, we'd like to get a few more um, 
filled out reports and I hear that the fall fishing at Merrill Lake is always the best. <laughs> uh, Warren, I just would like to point out that when it's raining out, there's no place unless you do it in your car to sign one of those things. You only got <laughs> the one pencil on the post. <laughs> well, on the ninth, there were half a dozen pencils and it's right in the rain paper. So I, I'm sorry that there weren't pencils there when you were there, but on the ninth, there were several. Okay. It may not be clear uh, that it's right in the rain paper, but uh, when it's wet <laughs> out, I don't know if people are going to be pulling that paper out and signing it. Do the best we can. So thank you, Warren. Um, any other fishing reports before I turn it over to the wind knots? Um, one more, Bart, uh, Jerry. Jerry. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a lake I'd never been to to on the side of uh, Mount Hood, uh, Badger Lake, and some of you may know it. Um, and I'd wondered about it and um, finally got a chance to uh, head over there about three weeks ago. And it's tucked away and included a 12 mile stretch of definitely need for uh, high clearance and four wheel drive on a road that <laughs> uh, 10 to 15 miles an hour. So the last stretch was over an hour drive just over that 12 miles. And, um, and it was, to make it better, there was brush that was hanging into the road, um, which caused some scratching on a relatively new paint job on our 99 Dodge, but but not terrible. <laughs> uh, but getting to the lake, um, two guys in float tubes were coming off when I got there. And I talked to them a little bit and then fished the afternoon. And um, I had the lake to myself on a beautiful day on, uh, on Mount Hood. And about 15, 20 minutes in, I saw a riser. I switched to a floating line. Um, stimulator, tied a soft tackle, and caught fish on the surface for three and a half hours steady. Um, mm. They were hungry fish. They were um, mostly, um, uh, you know, in the, you know, 10 to 12, 13 inch. The largest I caught was 15 inches, but it was a lot of fun and it was all on floating line and about 50-50 on the dry fly and the soft tackle. So if anybody's ever interested in going to Badger Lake, I'd love to join you and um, prefer to take your truck. So. <laughs> uh, now we know why we're hearing the report. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> if it was easy to get to, we would have never heard this report. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry. That's exactly what I've got. Three three lakes to visit now. Uh, to the report tonight. Uh, so, uh, are hey, there what, any... hey, Bart, one more thing. Jerry, can you take your phone and show everybody the picture of the fish that you caught recently, oh, like yesterday? I don't know how I'd do that. I Just tell them the story of what you caught. This is uh, this is awesome. Uh, well, it's a, my son and I went fishing at, uh, Trillium Lake and, um, uh, we tried to, it's kind of a, I don't know, we try to go once a year to Trillium. It doesn't always work out. Um, but he loves going there and, and, and I like it too. It's, it's fun. Um, and the fishing was just okay. Um, it was, um, not um, great fishing, but we caught fish beneath the surface. We caught some on the surface and we had a great time. Um, so uh, it was good. And we had one keeper only. Um, and I guess that's the one that, uh, but I picture I'll, I, this is the selfie. I'll show a selfie of my son and I, I don't know. Can you see that? That works. 
okay. So that's my son and I. And then, um, you know, fishing um, sometimes is just luck. And he, Mike was catching more fish than I was actually uh, for the day, but. No, um, he, he's more skilled, Jerry. Come on, let's just. Yeah, well, yeah, no question he is. I, I don't argue that. Um, but oh that's a 26 we're, we're, inch. We're looking at Steve uh, Jones. Cut. <laughs> Oh, let's see. 26 oh, nice inch. And that wow. is a rainbow or a brown? It's a cut. It's a cut? Holy mackerel. That's a cut? Wow. I, I believe so. a record. Anyway. It's got nice cheeks. Wow. Anyway, all right. So anyway. Trillium Lake. So Trillium Lake. They, I think they, they planted some big ones in there. Oh, uh, okay. Thank you, Don. So, so, you're, so, I guess the bottom line is you're looking for a ride. So, yeah, that's the, the main thing is a ride to Badger Lake, and uh, yeah, that'd be great. So, any wind knots, uh, memorable stories that anyone wants to wish to share on somebody else or themselves? <laughs> wind knots have been kind of a dry hole the last three or four months, if I remember. So, uh, Fishing usually revolves around water. Water usually requires some kind of a flotation device. Lance Ebert recently purchased himself a 16-foot fishing boat, a uh, smoker cool. craft, full motor, kicker motor. I had the same boat, just a year or two difference in age. So I went out with Lance to show him how to drop anchor and pick anchor up in the uh, Columbia River. Uh, we made arrangements to meet at 11 o'clock. And about 11.45, I contacted, or Lance contacted me, and he said, I'll get there as soon as I can find the boat keys. So we spent another hour or so waiting for him, but uh, he's quite excited. He's looking for any kind of advice he can get on how to fish out of a boat in any body of water. I'm I just sure. thought it was amazing, because he, he finally found his keys hanging in a hook on his flight time device. You, you see this wall behind me? I took the keys out because I was cleaning the dash and the rest of it, and I hung it back here. I couldn't find them. I looked everywhere because they were in a safe place, but they were just mixed in with my fly time stuff. So that's my wind knot for getting into the boat. <laughs> yeah, never keep your keys in a safe space. That is the quickest way to lose them. <laughs> no. So... Uh, do we have any other contenders here, or is this one going to go in acclamation? <laughs> who's, who's got the broken rod? Oh, who knows? <laughs> this I picked up. This is an old picture, so. Oh, okay. An old one, not. Well, it sounds like Lance has it by acclamation here, and <laughs> we'll, you'll go into running for the uh, win out of the year, Lance. Congratulations. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> and I'm sure you can find anybody here to show you how to fish from your boat. You just have to ask. I'm you know. sure there'll be a line. Exactly. So I'll uh, move to tonight's program, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Strong, uh, Vice President or Director of Programs. Chris? And, and uh, Eric Lesko is with us tonight. Eric, you're on. I did see that it looked like you're – I don't see you on my screen, but uh, are, are you all connected? I am. Yeah. Um, okay. I'm calling in on my cell phone though. So All right. um, I do have video. I don't know if it's showing, but anyway, that's what it well, is. Okay, we got that. So uh, Eric is with uh, Pacific Corps. He's a fish biologist. And what he's going to talk with us about tonight is some of the programs that are going on to try to get fish to where they are and reintroducing them up to that upper uh, North Fork area. Uh, I really am interested in learning how they bust these things. I, I've heard just general terms. So I'm hoping tonight we can get much clearer people like me that how do you catch them and move them and what are those fish doing when they're up there? And I know one thing Eric would like for many of us is anything we may have seen that ties to the work they're doing with fishing up in that area. So Eric, I'll let you get started. All right, great. Thank you, Chris. And uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks for the opportunity to share with you some of the aquatic programs that Pacific Corp 
has been initiated at least over the last decade or so. Um, I'm, should I share my screen here, Chris? Yes, please. Yes, please, you can. So right, let's see if, should see work. if this works. Um, I saw it choose option to view. Do you have to help in there, Bart? Well, I think that um, I've allowed multiple participants can share simultaneously. So you should be able just to share your screen, Eric. Okay. Um, yeah. Just for, the, just for the moment here, Eric, um, I'd ask everybody to mute your speakers so that we won't have things dance back and forth on the screen. Thank you. So do you see uh, some bull trout tails on your screen? No. no, no. Don't. Let's see what's going on here. Um, let me stop sharing here. Try this again. So I was right. able to actually just change my view to see Eric's. There he is. Okay. And that was my operator error on my end. So. Oh, so you can see it? Yeah, we can see it. Okay. Well, that's a success then. <laughs> yeah. um, all right. Well, Chris called me about a month ago, and so I put together a few slides here. Um, and um, I was thinking, it's been at least 20 years since I've addressed this group before. So... Uh, <laughs> I mean, I've been working for Pacific Corps for 27 years, and I don't know why you didn't invite me back. It took you 20 some years, but I'm glad to be here. And um, this is pretty informal, so I, if you have some questions, I invite you to ask them while I go through these slides. And of course, after we're all done here, we can have a little Q and A as well. So, anything of interest? Um, I selected the Fish Passage Program because that's pretty much our most challenging um, program right now. But I added some a few others in here. Um, but if you got any questions at all, they don't have to be related to, to what I've got up here, I'd be happy to answer them. So we'll go ahead and get started. So um, I'm sure everyone in this group and on the phone uh, has, <laughs> is very familiar with the Lewis River, but of course I have to just show you where we're, we're talking about. Um, we're on the North Fork Lewis River. Uh, the company's got actually four hydro projects up, up here. Um, the first one, of course, is Merwin. Um, I'm going to provide little pictures here. Hopefully, you can see them. Um, Merwin's our oldest dam. It um, was completed in 1931. And then we went on up to Yale, which was completed in 1953, uh, which is an earthen dam. And then uh, the first one up is called our Swift Number One project. Um, there's also a Swift Number Two project, which feeds off the tailwaters from Swift Dam. And that's owned by Cowlitz County PUD. So we're all in this together. Um, of course, I also added Lower Falls here because that is a barrier to all anadromous fish, no matter where we put them. Um, and yeah, that's it for that one. Um, oh, you know, if a lot of people don't know this, but above SWIFT, there were plans to put even more hydro projects up here. Uh, one on Rush Creek, one on Muddy River. Uh, I'm very glad they didn't. For those that have been up there and trounced around up there, it's a beautiful area, and uh, I'm so glad they didn't do that. So we do have some free-flowing section. It's about, oh, about 80 miles of spawning habitat upstream of Swift Dam, and we'll get into that in just a sec. Um, but before we do, I thought I'd just mention, um, you know, as a hydro company, we license these projects, as you know, uh, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And we have what's called the Lewis River Settlement Agreement. This is pretty much what we live by. Um, all the FERC licenses uh, reference this document. Uh, there's a number of signatories on this, on this, and it was dated back in November of 2004. Um, we were issued a 50-year license for all the projects. Um, we didn't receive those licenses until 2008. So we're essentially operating until 2058 under these licenses. But if you ever ask yourself, why are they doing this? It's, is ridiculous, which I get that a lot on some of these things. You'll see some of the things we're doing. It's all based on this settlement agreement and we're required to follow this settlement agreement, just like all the parties are. Um, so 
Um, if you've got any questions like that, I'll probably refer to it again here during this talk. Uh, just lastly, for background, um, we do have a goal here and you know why we're doing everything here is this lofty goal here, which I'll just read it to you. It's achieve genetically viable, self-sustaining, naturally reproducing, harvestable populations above Merwin Dam greater than minimum viable populations. There's a lot there, right? Um, it is in the settlement agreement. I guess that's the definition of success for this program, uh, but we certainly aren't there yet. So um, by the way, we started doing the reintroduction back in 2011. And I'll get into some of that. So I already heard a question of what's going on and why we're, what we're doing. Um, I thought I'd just put this simplified schematic, if you will, of the Lewis River and, and what happens here. So, you know, you have the North Fork Lewis River downstream of Merwin Dam. We have Merwin Dam, which has a sorting facility, which I've got some pictures to show. That's collecting the adults. Um, we're transporting coho, uh, late winter steelhead, and Chinook salmon. So we get an adult, we put it in a truck, hopefully several adults. We drive them all the way up to what we call the adult release site, um, which is uh, what we call Eagle Cliff. We release those fish there, and then they're free to spawn wherever. Um, once they spawn and produce juveniles and the smolts start doing their out migration, we have a collector. And again, I have pictures of all this um, at um, the Four Bay of Swift Dam. It collects these smolts. We put them in another truck and we drive them all the way down to Woodland um, at what we call our Woodland Release Site, which then they're free to go to the ocean. Um, and hopefully they survive and come back as adults to repeat this cycle. So obviously very labor intensive, um, but that's, in simple terms, that's, that's the whole program right now. So I thought I'd just start with Merwin first. So Merwin Dam, I'm sure you've seen it, you've been there, um, it's Concrete Arch Dam. Uh, I will say back, you know, when Merwin was being constructed, started in like 28 or 29, they did have a fish wheel there. Um, so I grabbed this old photograph of an active fish wheel at the Merwin Dam site where they would then load them in trucks and actually take them to Lewis River hatchery for spawning. Um, so things have changed quite a bit. <laughs> so we did these major upgrades to the dam. I think it was in 2011. Um, and I, if you see right here, there's a, a little spot here in the corner of where the powerhouse is and the turbines. There's a little opening there, which is the original uh, trap that was built into the dam back in the 1930s. It's just been upgraded. Um, so it's that little weir opening right there is where all the fish enter. And once they enter there, this might help a little bit. Um, so you have that, that little weir in the tail race. Um, I think, yeah, yeah, we got a little video here. I don't know how it's showing up here, <laughs> if you can see that. But they, there's basically four pools in there, and each one has a weir. So they go into pool two and three, four. And then when they get to four here, there's a weir gate which basically crowds all these fish into what we call the fish hopper or elevator. Once they're in there, the fish then, um, you know, they're lifted and into a fish conveyance pipe and they go to the sorting facility. So let's take a look at that. Because this, um, this is when engineers get together and they come up with these ideas and sometimes they come to reality. So there's a lot of moving parts here. Um, and what I just call the Merwin conveyance structure. So this first picture you see here is actually the, um, the hopper. It's sitting way down low, right? Um, that hopper in this middle picture is basically once it's, once it's filled and it's automated as well. Um, it, by crane, comes all the way up this structure here. And on the top of this picture here, you can see what's the fish conveyance pipe. So that it unloads into this pipe, goes all the way down to what we call this pre-sort pond. So every fish that comes to the Merwin Dam is going through this pipe into this pond. And this building behind it is the actual sorting facility uh, where everything gets sorted. So I grabbed some pictures have, here. Uh, any idea yeah. what percentage of fish remain in the lower river and never enter the uh, structure you're talking about? And is there a mortality rate within that structure? Um, yes to both 
uh, I would say we've done some steelhead um, surveys where we're trying to find out essentially what the trap effectiveness is. So how many fish that get to that bridge actually enter the trap. And for steelhead, it's pretty high, um, actually, and also for coho. Um, and I say pretty high, you know, it varies from about 60%. I know we've had as high as 90%. Um, steelhead being steelhead sometimes knows up there and then they leave the system actually and go somewhere else. Um, but the ones that actually get to that bridge, which is probably what, a few hundred meters below the, the, the trap opening, a majority of those fish do actually enter the trap, more coho than steelhead. So um, salmon, Chinook salmon, we haven't had enough to actually test it. So we don't know for Chinook salmon, but that is one of our metrics. Um, we need to prove that actually the trap is, I think, 95% effective, if I'm not mistaken. And then as far as mortalities, you know, with all these moving parts, it happens. Sometimes the hopper gets stuck or fish get under the hopper or the hopper's broken and there's no oxygen in the hopper and um, things happen. So we do have mortalities and of course we're required to report those to um, the agencies. Um, as a whole, it's, it's minimal and we also have a metric for that. It's less than 2% and we are achieving that. Um, so yeah, we do have mortalities, um, but they're very rare. Um, sometimes we get weird fish in this trap. Um, if you look on the pictures on the right there, there's a small mouth bass, pretty good size one actually, um, this picture here. And then we have a tiger muskie. Um, mm. I'm sure you, most of you know that the state stocks tiger muskies into Merwin. Sometimes they spill out. When we have high runoff years, we'll, uh, we'll spill um, a tiger muskie or two out. So sometimes we get surprises. So these numbers here of adults trapped, is this cumulative 2014 to 2019 or is this average per year? Nope, this is cumulative. So just over the period of okay. operation here, at least for what that six total years, you can see that most of the fish are coho. And this is just Merwin. There's two traps. One is at Lewis River Hatchery as well. And I don't have those numbers here um, as we're just talking about Merwin. Um, but coho and steelhead, summer steelhead in particular, you know, we're doing pretty well. Um, spring chinook, not so well. False Chinook don't normally enter the trap, although that population, you know, is 20,000 downstream of Merwin. Um, so we don't want those. Those aren't a transport species. They'll stay in the lower river. Uh, once in a while, we'll get a sockeye. I think these are kokanee that probably spill out of Merwin, um, along with a tiger muskie or two. Um, very few chum salmon, which isn't, you know, a surprise. They don't travel very far in systems and they're notoriously poor jumpers. Um, some, a few pinks, and of course, we, do, we also move cutthroat. Um, the Lewis has always had, I'll say, just an endemic population of cutthroat. There was some hatchery production going on, I think, back in the 90s, um, but that was stopped. Um, but the cutthroat population remains, and I'm sure some of you have fished upstream of Swift for cutthroat. And um, um, if, we, if, if those go into the collector, we, we transport cutthroat as well. Any other questions on that little piece? Um, I added uh, a table here. So remember that goal I shared with you earlier about viable populations and such. Well, we do have a target for upstream transport of adults. And again, we're only moving late winter steelhead. When I say late winter steelhead, these, these are the natural origin steelhead. These aren't the chambers that you might be familiar with. Um, these fish, spawn in um, you know, March, April, all the way through June, like a normal steelhead, not like a chamber that spawns in November. Um, and, you know, we started, um, well, I'll wait till the end of the direct presentation. I've got another slide there. Um, but only 1,700 of those coho, both, both early and late are transported up. Our goal is 6,800. We've done pretty well with coho in recent years. And this year's gonna be no exception. We have a huge coho run this year, probably gonna be a record. Uh, when it's all tallied. And then if you look at spring Chinook, uh, we're not doing so well. Um, we're getting very few uh, spring Chinook back. This, isn't, this is what's transported. So broodstock, the hatches are taking those. And then what's left over, we get to take upstream. Um, we're nowhere near this goal of 3,000. So this is one of those challenges um, that I talked about. It's been you know, almost 10 years now, and we're still not getting the spring Chinook back that uh, we had expected. So that's an issue. Eric, why aren't summer steelhead a transport species? 
You know, I think because um, they're a Skamania stock, they're no, there's not a natural stock in there, um, but that could be said of the, the Spring Chinook as well. Um, I think historically, or some of the literature back when they were doing the settlement agreement said that summer steelhead don't travel up there. Now, uh, as much as the winters, but you know, whether that's true or not, I, I'm sure summer steelhead would be more than happy to travel all the way up to Swift, um, honestly. So um, I don't have a good answer for you other than there's Skamania stock. And the thought was that there weren't a lot of summer steelhead naturally before the dams were there that were up there. So they were not included as a transport species. Hmm. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, this next slide is the, that Eagle Cliff site I told you about. This would be called our adult release site. A uh, little primitive right now, but it works. Um, you can see in this, um, well, this first slide is basically the chute that the, the truck that you can see in the second slide backs up into and they pull the gate and those fish go down this black tube that's underground here. This is only blowing out like three times now in the last 10 years. So <laughs> it's kind of a problem, but I mean, it works, right? The third slide here shows the fish being dumped in at Eagle Cliff into a nice pool here. And then they're again, free to spawn or move wherever they want after release. Which I have a couple slides here just showing, you know, where do those fish go, right? Once, once they're released. Um, and the Eagle Cliff, you can see my cursor, I don't know if you can, but most of you are probably familiar, it's, it's about right here. It's where the Eagle Cliff Bridge crosses the North Fork Lewis River at the upper end of Swift. So um, we've been trouncing around up there after these fish are released and looking for spring chinook carcasses and reds for both uh, spring chinook and coho. And I just took all the data we had from 2012 to 2019 to say, where are all the coho, where are all the spring chinook? So, these yellow squares are where we find uh, coho uh, reds and, you know, pretty good distribution, right? I mean, all the way up to here to Lower Falls, certainly the main stem North Fork has a lot of activity, especially the side channels, but even up in the Muddy River drainage, especially like Clear Creek is really popular with coho. Um, the, and not to mention clear water, which is great. We also have a few stragglers um, way up here in the, in the drainage. Um, as far as Chinook, again, we don't have a whole lot of data on them, but definitely mainstream spawners for the most part. Yeah, you do get some in the muddy and, you know, one here in this tributary of Drift Creek. So um, coho are great distributors. Um, Chinook, not so much, but that's really based on numbers. They're, they're, we haven't put a lot up there. Um, if we look at steelhead, these, and these uh, are these can late winter steelhead. Yeah. If you go back to that previous slide, you're only talking... Uh, the Where first six or seven miles above Eagle Creek for the coho spawning, uh, most of them run up the muddy, right? Yeah, so here's that slide with the coho. So is this within one you, you're you referring to? You have a to? lot of the upper main stem that's not being used by spawners? Um, no, they are all the way up to Lower Falls. So oh, right okay. here where this all ends, this is Lower Falls. It's just not right. documented on the slide. I'm sorry, I'm, I, I got pictures in front of the river. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Hey, Eric, yep. Eric, you're about 20 minutes in. Are you okay on your flow rate for what you got tonight? I don't know how many slides you have. I don't have too many more, maybe five uh, okay. or Okay, I'm not, I'm not pushing you. I just want to make sure you know about where you are. Yeah, thank you. Okay, okay. You get rambling and forget about time. Yeah. Um, so talking about steelhead, uh, again, 2014 to 19, um, these are radio tag detections. So we put, actually put radio tags in the steelhead every year and we fly around in our helicopter and uh, note their locations through GPS. And you know, steelhead are steelhead, right? They go everywhere. Um, we even have steelhead that are going past the dam here, as you can see, Swift Dam's about right here. So this is the Four Bay area. And, um, you know, all these, they're basically seeding the entire drainage that's available to them, which is great. This is great to see. All right, so you've heard about the Swift Floating Surface Collector. I'm sure you've probably seen it. Maybe you've gone on a tour or two. Um, I thought I'd share some pictures here of when it was constructed, just to give you a size or an idea of the size of this thing. It's basically a big boat, floating boat, um, that they constructed at um, uh, Swift Boat Ramp. And they 
put it all the way out here to the edge and uh, finished it right here and waited for the reservoir to come up and they floated it down to uh, Swift Dam, which they built this, um, uh, what do you call it? Um, the trucks go down this and um, you'll see in this next picture that it's attached to, right? So trucks come over across the dam down this, uh, I call it a bridge, it's not a bridge, but that's the only word I can think, but, and then you have this floating surface collector, which is deballasted in these pictures, by the way. So it's usually sitting much lower. Um, the advantage of a floating collector though is Swift, the Swift reservoir elevations are up and down, right? They can fluctuate almost a hundred feet and they have in the past. Um, so this thing can operate and catch fish at, you know, not a hundred foot, but probably like 80 feet of reservoir fluctuation, um, which was pretty important because, you know, this is our main flood control reservoir. And um, we had to bring it down quite a bit here in the fall for uh, the winter rains. Um, just to give you a perspective of what all the moving parts are here. So you have this boat, which we call the floating surface collector, um, the trestle, that's what it is. The trestle that was built to anchor uh, this floating surface collector. We also have a net that goes all the way down to the bottom. From the surface to the bottom, this net is, you know, in place so fish don't get behind here. I'm not gonna say fish don't get behind here because sometimes they do. So it's not 100% effective. Um, a recent addition is this guide net. If you can see my cursor. So fishing are coming down here, they wanna to go to the ocean. These nets help guide these fish into this, what we call a net transition structure. And I'll show you some pictures here. Um, here it is, this I'm first sorry photo. I'm sorry again. Do you have any yeah. idea how many fish don't make the structure or stay in the lake? Yes, yeah, so um, that's kind of one of the biggest challenges we have right now. We've done both radio telemetry as well as, um, um, trying to think of the word, um, hydroacoustics to map in 3D where these fish are and what they're doing and why they're not all, you know, we're not having 100% efficiency. So, this is probably our biggest challenge is, so you have all these smolts coming into Swift. Let's say you have 100,000 coho and we only collect, let's say 50,000. Um, so you're at 50% efficiency, right? That's not enough to create, to achieve our goal of self-sustaining populations. Um, right now it's, you know, we're around 60 to 65% on average. Um, we're required to be at 95%. Will we ever get there? Uh, Probably not, no one's got to 95%, but this is a work in progress. And you know, do we need 95% for self-sustaining populations? No, um, but we would like to see something north of 80. Um, and in some years we get there, but it's not consistent. So they're trying to figure out right now, Chris Karcheski, I don't know if you know him, he is our fish passage program lead. And he's looking at ways to figure out how to capture more fish because what they do is they go to the, the entrance here and they'll get to about right here and then they'll swim out. So that's not good, right? And then we don't see them again. Um, so yeah, good point. That's what's one of our main problems. Um, I don't know if this is gonna work, but there's a video here, you can see. Um, fish come in, this is basically a big filter and there's bar screens of different widths that are catching or sorting different size fish as they come through this chute. Um, those look like golden dales actually, if you can see it, it's even working. Um, and then they're, they're um, put into these um, uh, tanks and sorted. And guess what? They go back on a truck. So we brought the adults back on a truck. Now we're bringing all the little guys on a truck and we're trucking those down to Woodland. Um, truck after truck after truck, we run 24 seven um, and it, it just never stops. So uh, thanks again to the settlement agreement, that's right now where we're at. Um, I do have some numbers here. Maybe this gets at some of your questions here. You know, how many do we catch? Um, predominantly coho, but you know, we have a lot more coho adults up there spawning. So we have a lot more smolts. Um, it's getting better um, for coho. Uh, winter steelhead, you know, we're kind of, it's variable. Um, again, that's not enough for self-sustaining. And then spring chinook, um, I put an asterisk on this number because we have spring chinook that are actually spawning in there and never going to the ocean. So we have landlocked spring chinook on there. We may be getting a few of those. Um, so despite the number of adults that we don't truck up there, we're, we're still getting 
smolts from natural production up in Swift, which is fine because then they're going back to the ocean, hopefully, or at least getting released at woodland. And then again, cutthroat trout, but by and far it's coho mainly. So this is a picture of where they are released. And you may have seen this um, was, if you're on the river or passing through woodland um, on the way up to the river, this is our release pond. Uh, it's right below the bed and breakfast um, in woodland. And um, fish are, are put in these ponds, they're held for 24 hours to assess any mortality. And then they're essentially flushed out through this conveyance, which is underground here, and then surfaces this chute right out to the river and then uh, they're free to go. So any questions on just that whole program? It's complicated, I don't have a lot of time to get into too many details, so I kind of went through it pretty quick. Um, are there any questions on the Fish Passage program? Well, I've got one, Eric, and maybe uh, maybe it's too early, but it's, it is a floating collector. What are the top two things you would need to improve to hit the sustainability objectives? Uh, number one would be collection efficiency. So the efficiency of the collector itself that is how many fish, um, what we call a zone of influence. So picture a few hundred meters out of the collector there, all the fish that would make it to that point, you know, we need to collect, according to our license, 95% of those. So, you know, we're not there. Um, we need those. It's always, that's always the bottleneck. It's always the smolts, getting the smolts out of the system. Adults are easy, right? They're big, they, go, they spawn, they do their thing. Getting the smolts to the collector and collected is, is their biggest challenge. Right. Um, so, I mean, that's really it. Survivability is great. I mean, they're surviving. It's just, we don't have the fish to, we're not releasing enough fish downstream to get a, a population back that's sustainable without these hatcheries. And that's a bigger problem than trying to get the adults up you said some of the adults don't want to come in um, yeah. to the trap. Right. right. Okay. Um, and they'll spawn in the lower river. Um, you know, we, yeah. They don't want hatchery fish spawning in the lower river, but um, like late winter steelhead, I mean, we want them to spawn in the river too. We don't want to take too many of those out and um, mine that population. Okay, thank you. Oh. Um, just real quick, uh, I do oversee the hatchery program. Uh, it's super important. It's what we're using mainly for this reintroduction program. Um, there's three of them on, on the system, Lewis River, which is downstream of Merwin, and then also Merwin, which is right at, essentially right at Merwin Dam, and then Speedy Eye Hatchery, which I heard people mention on this call earlier, uh, which is up by Merwin. So we fund the operation of all these hatcheries. Uh, WDFW operates them. Um, we put a lot of capital dollars in these as part of our license. Uh, here's a look at Lewis River. Um, you know, these used to be just earth ponds and we've turned them into raceways and put a whole new sorting facility in here. Uh, this is really the workhorse of the system um, because it rears all the coho salmon and also all the spring chinook. So according to our license, we put 2 million coho smolts, hatchery produced coho smolts in the river every year, as well as 1.3 million spring chinook. And they're all released here at the hatchery. Uh, Merwin is a trout hatchery uh, constructed in 1993. Uh, this is really our trout hatchery. So it provides the steelhead both summers and uh, winters, as well as the rainbow plants that we put in at Swift Reservoir. So 50,000 Golden Dales, we get eggs from Golden Dale and then rear them here at uh, Merwin. And then we put them in at um, Swift Reservoir every year for, uh, for harvest. You guys got to do a better job of getting those golden deals, by the way. We're, there's too many going into the collector. <laughs> um, last, lastly, the Spiele Eye Hatchery. Um, this is an older picture. It looks a little bit different here. In fact, I just uh, we just got done putting shade covers on all these raceways. Um, I had some capital dollars last year, so I, I got to go ahead to do that, and it was just completed. So all these, um, what you see here, open raceways, are now shaded, uh, as well as adult holding ponds. Um, you know, we're seeing a lot of disease up here. That's the problem with spring chinook is we're getting a lot of uh, BKD, bacterial kidney disease, um, and it's taking its toll. Um, even though a fish might be alive when you release it, if it has BKD, it's probably not gonna survive to the ocean. Um, and speedy is really important because it's, it's got spring water. 
So it's the early rearing source for both uh, spring chinook and coho. And I'm sure you're all aware of the kokanee fishery. Um, we put 93,000 kokanee a year into Merwin and it's turned out to be a really popular um, fishery, which is, I'm really surprised. I mean, it's doing great. Uh, just one last thing I wanted to mention because you might see these in the river uh, and maybe you have operated these in the past. Uh, these are called screw traps, um, very common <clears throat> um, for uh, juvenile, uh, capturing juvenile smolts in the river. I'll tell you they're a, <clears throat> excuse me, they're, they're a pain to operate, but we operate two, two sites. One's here at Eagle Cliff. You may have seen it when you go over the bridge up there. Um, usually it's from February through July, uh, depending on water flows. There's this one, which is catching all the, trying to catch a sample of those smolts from all those adults we released. And we put a tag in them, then we can get an idea of uh, whether or not they make it to the FSC and reservoir survival. We get abundance data, we get timing data. There's also a screw trap, which is a tandem trap here down in the lower river at uh, right near the golf course um, on a really good salmon fishing hole that we do get calls about if we leave them out there too long. So um, their only purpose though, is to collect smolts and get an idea of what the number of smolts passing that trap while they're in operation. Um, I don't want to get into too many details about that. Um, they're effective, but they always break and it can be sometimes a little bit dangerous. <laughs> um, I did, I only have two slides here. So I'm running over time here. Um, I just want to mention this late winter steelhead program because a lot of, there's a lot of confusion about it. And a lot of people have seen us out there doing what we call tangle netting in the low river. We get calls and people saying, hey, people are gill netting out there. What's going on? Enforcement gets notified. It's, you know, um, we don't do that anymore. But uh, the purpose of that was we go out into the river and now we use the Merwin trap, but we're collecting these natural origin late winters uh, for our broodstock. Um, and the reason we're doing that is we're bringing them into the hatchery, we're rearing them for a year, we're releasing about 60,000. So somewhere around 50 spawning pairs are used to get 60,000 smolts that we release. And we put a little blank wire tag in their snout. So, um, you know, we know that it's a, what we call a program fish. It still has its adipose fin, so it's not available for harvest. Um, and we all know that's not a guarantee, but they're not, <laughs> they're not supposed to be harvested. So um, when these fish, come back as adults, then um, we take those fish up, up river. Um, it's a unique program because it's using these natural origin steelhead. And, you know, we've caught fish down there that's, you know, exceeded 20 pounds. Uh, it's common for these natural origin steelhead. And I, I just don't think people give them the, the credit of the Lewis River natural origin steelhead uh, that are in that river. Um, we do abundant surveys, you know, it's maybe only 800 or so that are spawning in the lower river, um, but it perseveres and you know, it's not talked about much, but they're there and the anglers know they're there too, by the way, um, but they're not supposed to be catching them. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just leave it at that and uh, maybe just do the um, any questions you have. Um, we went through that pretty quick. So if you got any questions you think on anything, getting, let me know. Do you think there's any natural spawning going on especially up in Swift? Um, from our transport fish, or I mean? Uh, well, fish that are left behind, right? The smolt that aren't making it into your catching? Yes. Um, I'd say that's true of spring chinook, where we see these kind of small spring chinook. By the way, spring chinook are now seeded, and uh, they've made it to Yale, and they've also made it to Merwin, and we always get reports of um, people catching salmon, adult salmon. So those are smolts that have left Swift and traveled through the system. but um, yes, there's a, what we would call a residual population of spring schnook, and there's also the steelhead kelts. So we put an adult steelhead up there. We have a little bit of trouble getting the kelts out, um, that have already spawned because steelhead don't die after they spawn. They want to go back to the ocean and do it again. So what happens is some of those steelheads stay in swift and we don't collect them. And then come the next spring, um, and this isn't very well documented, but those fish would then be available to spawn again. So I do think there's some of that going on for sure. Um, for both salmon and um, uh, steelhead. I haven't seen it really with coho or we haven't seen that yet, but I, there's no reason why they wouldn't be doing it too. 
I've heard uh, different things, but what is your assessment on the impact of this system on the bull trout population swift? Yeah, I didn't put any bull trout picture or um, program here, but we've been um, surveying the bull trout population, which are in all three reservoirs, by the way. Um, swift for sure has the largest population, the most abundance, um, and you know it's anywhere from three to 800 spawning uh, adults that actually are on a spawning run. Um, so it's one of those questions like the Goldendales or these fish that we're putting in there, are they having an impact on bull trout? And so it's something that we look at really close and we work with the US Fish and Wildlife Service and there's a bull trout lower Columbia working group that has a monitoring that's done every year to kind of assess whether or not we're having an impact uh, either through predation, you know, Golden Dale's actually eating bull trout. We don't see much of that. Bull trout are pretty tough, right? They're, they're an apex predator. Uh, they'll eat a, a lot of the smolts we thought, right? We put all these smolts up there. Um, they'll probably eat a lot. Um, so, you know, we've been doing this 10 years. Has we've seen any changes in the bull trout population? It has gone down a little bit. Um, not to critical levels, but we have noticed a little bit of a trend downward. Um, that could be attributed to this uh, reintroduction program or something else. Um, bull trout are funny, you know, they used to spawn in Rush Creek and Pine Creek pretty equally. Now it's almost all Pine Creek and very little in Rush Creek um, for whatever reason. And we're looking at ways to try and improve that at Rush Creek and get more bull trout in there. Um, I, I heard that anglers as a incidental catch uh, are catching some very large bull trout and swift. I believe it. I'm talking it's like problem. 40 inches. Yep. Ah, 40 inches is pretty good fish. That's got to be at least a 12 year old bull trout. Um, we've seen, oh, I can't remember my millimeters, like 920, I think, is the biggest one we've got. So I'm just wondering if the uh, anglers are going to have any impact then on the bull trout if uh, that's not your, your problem, is it? Hey, well, see, we see it happen. And you know, we hire enforcement agents. There's two enforcement agents that we hire and we let them know every time we see people up there because you put coho in there, for example, and people will start fishing for coho. Well, bull trout are really susceptible to um, angling because they're, they will eat anything that moves basically, especially when they're starting to make a spawning run. So they're susceptible. Yeah. And I think you're right. I, that's probably the biggest impact right now to bull trout is humans uh, poaching and it happens all the way from Eagle Cliff, all the way up to Rush. Um, the, the only thing we can do is tell enforcement about what we see. And they do patrol the area um, at those times when they're most vulnerable. But yeah, they're big fish and I know people are targeting them. It's unfortunate. Eric, uh, what is the Goldendale you're referring to? Uh, Goldendale Hatchery. Up by uh, Carson. It's so a was, trout. Oh, trout? Yeah. Okay. Um, they're also a um, fall spawner, and they've been used in Swift for, you know, I've been here, like I said, 27 years. Uh, it's usually Golden Dales. I know they've used some uh, Tacoma stock, and we just recently talked about using triploids, but we didn't support that yet because there isn't enough information. Um, but because they're a false spawner, they don't interfere uh, as much as, say, a, a regular rainbow trout with our steelhead program. That would be my biggest concern. So we're kind of stuck with the Goldendales for now. Um, we're trying to figure out if there's something that will work better. Because um, what's happening, like I said, they get into the collector and we end up transporting them downstream and below Merman, which we don't want to do. Yeah. Yeah, we could um, if you could get those uh, golden dales to respond to a surface fly. I think we would catch a whole lot more of them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you <have> trainers. <laughs> so I'm uh, at the hatchery to start doing that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Training them. Get, yeah. Um, so our club has been involved in conservation on the East Fork Lewis for um, nearly 15 years with the nutrient enhancement program. And, you know, we were also pretty instrumental in getting that designated a gene bank river. You were talking about those, those uh, lower river spawning fish, spawning steelhead. Um, 
is that population really an East Fork population that is just moved around between the main stem and the East Fork, or is it distinct? It's actually distinct. Okay. Um, the East Fork is, um, at least genetically speaking, they have what they call baselines for the East Fork Lewis River, as well as what we call Lewis River Merwin Cedar. So I did have this slide, I didn't talk about it, but we screen every steelhead that we use for broodstock or potential broodstock. So we screened um, you know, about 1,100 actual adult steelhead. And by and large, they are actually Lewis River or Cedar Creek, which is the North Fork Lewis stock which yes. can be differentiated from the East Fork. We really don't get that many East Forks. Um, this mm. stock in the North Fork is, um, this is why I have such interest in this one because you know, all the things we've done, the steelhead of all the other species have persevered through all these years since Merwin went into place. Um, that's pretty cool. And I know steelhead like to stray a lot. So we do get some you know, from other systems, the Toodle and the river. Um, we get a lot of those. We also get a lot of clam of fish, you know, but for the most part, these are Lewis River fish and they just keep coming back. Interesting. Eric, do okay. Any, do you have any estimates of smoke adult survival rates uh, from your smolts from your reintroduction program? I'm wondering how they compare to other you know, nearby systems. Yeah, um, we would love to get those, but with the numbers that we're releasing, we really can't get a good estimate. Um, there's going to, the confidence intervals would be so huge on it, it wouldn't be a very practical or useful estimate. So it's one thing we really want to do. Um, we're using the hatcheries as a surrogate now, which isn't really, I mean, that's not apples to apples. Um, you're taking a natural fish and you want to know, you know what its survival rate is. So we would love to get that information. Uh, we just can't because we don't have enough fish to tag to get enough fish out there to give us a, a good estimate, but we're required to do so. So keep our fingers crossed, we'll get more fish from the collector as time goes on and be able to do that. I think we've gone for a while. I, it, we should look at wrapping. Are there other questions you'd really like to give Eric while we got him or should we call it a, a night? Uh, just curious. Uh... You used to have the upper Lewis open, and then you had that closure starting July 15th for the lower part of the upper Lewis above Eagle Cliff. Uh, is that going to stay in place permanently? Is that to protect the bull trout or the salmon, or what is that there to protect? A little bit of both. You're talking about the regulation where yeah. it's, yeah. Um, the Eagle Cliff is such a problem, right? And the regulations, I mean, DFW gets... <laughs> They get more complicated every year, it seems like. Um, it, it's really hard to track, right? So to answer your question, yes, it's protect bull trout, number one. And secondly, the, the reintroduction program. So we have adults running through there in the spring. We don't want people fishing, whether they're the adults or the smolts moving back out. Um, at least not yet. At some point that we do want harvest up there. The state wants harvest. And I'm sure people would love to catch a steelhead or a spring chinook. I would love to do that. Um, I'm an avid fly fisherman myself, so I would, uh, I would welcome that. We're just not there yet. So there's some regulations in place to protect both bull trout and reintroduction fish. I used to go up there in September and do really well on coho in Eagle Cliff Pool. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I, you know, I don't remember at one point it was not legal to do so, and they may open it up and they keep changing it. So I think um, when they first did the reintroduction, it was open to fish. Eagle Cliff, and then they closed it off starting July 15th or something. Okay. Yeah, that sounds right. And then, you know, people don't, all people don't get the word. So when we're doing our spawner surveys, we see people fishing. And it's not my job to, you know, highly inform them, but, um, you know, it's just me out there. So <laughs> I see them. I make note of it. The, the um, word is know. that the state is considering a proposal to change that regulation so that it would be open to catch and release during that time. Mm -hmm. but that that's yeah. still in the works yeah i think that would be fine um I, I guess at that point it's really a bull trout issue because like i say they're just so vulnerable i mean if you know what you're doing you can catch a lot of bull trout and really have an impact on that on the bull trout population and i know some of that's going on i don't i don't know how much i have a question this is russ flaskerud can you hear me yes yes yeah uh, i was up uh at swift camp last last week 
and camping up there. It's free camping, by the way, uh, at Swift Camp. And uh, there are people fishing the reservoir at the mouth of the, the Lewis River where it comes out of uh, uh, the, uh, below the, the uh, bridge at mm -hmm. Eagle, Cra Eagle uh, Cliff. Mm -hmm. How far towards the river can you fish? You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, you can, I do. You know, the, the, the reservoir is so low, you can walk way up, you know, to the mouth of the river. And there were oh, right. yeah. guys fly fishing. And I don't know if this is legal or not. Um, well, I think in the regulations, unless they've changed, there's the Eagle Cliff Bridge, which is a marker. And then they had these buoys down about a quarter mile below there. The reservoir is open, I think, below those buoys, if not the bridge. Okay. So I'm not sure where that ends. And it closes it sometime in November. Yeah. Um, so if they're fishing, I know if they're fishing above the bridge, uh, no, it's, uh, it's below, not this open. Is below the bridge, this is below the mouth. And the, yep. so the buoy is about equal to where the high bank ends on the north bank. So if they're fishing between the where the high bank ends to the bridge, they're fishing illegally. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This, this is this is much lower than that. This is more towards the reservoir and the fishing. So really I, I I think. And you can talk to the guy in the Eagle Cliff store, but I think uh, from the high bank on the south bank is the buoy. Uh, it's still considered a reservoir, even at low water, where you just got the channel going through there. Don't talk mm -hmm. to the guy at the store. He doesn't know. We, <laughs> he's been good, he's, I he's good at source of information for me. I don't know. But anyways, there's a from that high bank across, there's a buoy, and that's considered the reservoir whether it's high water or low water. Yeah, they, these, these were below, below the buoy, so they, they were legal. But uh, I was up uh, fishing illegally not too many <laughs> months ago. After, <laughs> after, after the 15th of, of July, I called, yeah, uh, I called the store. I, off, I even stopped at the store when I went up there because I thought, oh, the locals will know. He said, oh, yeah, it's open. It's all open. Thank you very much. And so I went <laughs> started fishing on the river and then I went up on the bank and I saw the sign on the on the trees up there yeah so, sounds hmm. like a sounds like a wind nut to me so. <laughs> Don't tell so, uh, so, well maybe we ought to educate that guy yeah. have a course well, thank you Eric uh, great presentation uh, we are all a little more knowledgeable about what's going on up there and what we see and yes we stay away from screw traps when we see them in the river so thank you for that warning um, so, and I'll also, uh, you've identified yourself as a uh, fly fisherman. I'm going to have Chris make sure that you have an application to Clark's Community of Fly Fishing. So, hey, you know what? I love that. it. I would love it. I, <laughs> okay. And uh, we, we, will, we, will, we will have you back far sooner. Well, uh, you have 27 years in. We're, we'll, have, we've, we'll have you in sooner than either 20 years or your retirement. Whatever comes first. How about that? So, yeah, right. Okay. Well, well send me an application. They, <laughs> okay, well, thank you for all the work that you're doing up there, and thank the company. Um, uh, laudable goals, and thank you for your investments in there and uh, bringing the fishing back on the on the on the Lewis River. So, oh, thank um, you. Yep. Okay. So Thanks thank a lot, you, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for yep. putting that program together, and gentlemen, thank you for um, um, sticking through it. Uh, I think it was great information. Um, thank you for those folks who've been participating in the enhancement projects and the other conservation projects out there. Thank you, Fishmasters. Uh, thank you, Marv uh, and Warren and Jim for the outing and those who um, held the uh, memorial for Ralph uh, Randall uh, a couple weeks ago. Thank you for that. And uh, we will see you on the water at our next meeting next month. So thank you. Thank you very much.